In this section, I'm going to introduce the formal definition of the Laplace transform and explain the relationship between the Laplace and continuous time Fourier transforms. At this point, I'd like to introduce the formal definition of the Laplace transform, or more specifically, the bilateral Laplace transform. The bilateral Laplace transform of the function little x, which is denoted as L little x, or simply big X, is given by this particular equation here. The bilateral Laplace transform is invertible, and the inverse Laplace transform of big X, which is denoted L inverse big X, or simply little x, is given by this particular formula here. Where the line real part of s is equal to sigma is in the region of convergence of big x. In other words, the region in the complex plane where big x converges. Note that the variable little s, with respect to which the integration is being performed, is complex valued. So this integration is not an ordinary integration, but rather is a contour integration, that is an integration along a path in the complex plane. As a matter of terminology, little x and big x are said to constitute what is called a Laplace transform pair. This relationship is denoted by this notation here, where the thing on the left of the double arrow, little x, is the original function, and the thing on the right of the double arrow is its corresponding Laplace transform, which in this case is big x. Although in principle the inverse Laplace transform of a function can be computed using the equation involving contour integration given on this slide, in practice the inverse Laplace transform is not usually determined in this way. Instead, as will be seen later, we typically resort to other means in order to compute the inverse Laplace transform. In practice, two different versions of the Laplace transform are commonly used the bilateral or two-sided Laplace transform and the unilateral or one-sided Laplace transform. Typically the bilateral Laplace transform is best suited for system analysis whereas the unilateral Laplace transform is most frequently used to solve systems of linear differential equations with non-zero initial conditions. As it turns out the only difference between the definitions of the bilateral and unilateral Laplace transforms is in the lower limits of integration in the integral used to define the Laplace transform. In the bilateral case, the lower limit of integration is minus infinity, whereas in the unilateral case, the lower limit of integration is zero. For the most part, we'll focus our attention primarily on the bilateral Laplace transform. Although the unilateral Laplace transform will be covered, it will only be discussed in the context of solving differential equations. Unless otherwise noted, all subsequent references to the Laplace transform should be understood to mean the bilateral Laplace transform. As mentioned earlier, the Laplace transform can be thought of as a generalization of the classical Fourier transform. Such a perspective is justified in the sense that the classical Fourier transform can be obtained as a special case of the Laplace transform. In particular, we have the following. Let big X and big X subscript capital F denote the Laplace and continuous time Fourier transforms of little x respectively. The function big X, evaluated at j omega, in other words a point on the imaginary axis, yields big X subscript capital F of omega. In other words, we have this particular relationship here. And essentially what this relationship is saying is evaluating the Laplace transform on the imaginary axis yields the Fourier transform. Due to the preceding relationship, the Fourier transform of little x is sometimes written as big X of j omega. Technically speaking, however, when we write the Fourier transform in this manner, big X is not actually the Fourier transform of little x. Rather, big X is the Laplace transform of little x, and it's only when we evaluate the Laplace transform on the imaginary axis that we obtain the Fourier transform. Knowing that a relationship exists between the Laplace transform evaluated on the imaginary axis and the Fourier transform, one might wonder if any relationship exists in the case that the Laplace transform is evaluated at an arbitrary point in the complex plane. In fact, a relationship does exist in this case. In particular, we have the following result. The function big X, 
evaluated at an arbitrary complex value s equal to sigma plus g omega, where sigma corresponds to the real part of s, and omega corresponds to the imaginary part of s, can also be expressed in terms of a Fourier transform involving little x. In particular, we have this relationship here, where big X subscript capital F prime is the continuous time Fourier transform of the function little x prime, where little x prime is given by this formula here. In other words, this function little x prime is just an exponentially weighted version of the function little x, where this exponential weighting is in particular by a real exponential, because sigma is a real value. So in general, the Laplace transform of little x is the Fourier transform of an exponentially weighted version of little x. Due to this weighting, the Laplace transform of a function may exist when the Fourier transform of the same function does not. At this point, I'd like to prove the two main results presented on this slide. First, I'd like to prove the result that relates the Laplace transform evaluated at a point on the imaginary axis to the Fourier transform. In this example, we're asked to show that the Laplace transform evaluated on the imaginary axis yields the continuous time Fourier transform. In what follows, let big X denote the Laplace transform of little x. To begin, we recall the definition of the Laplace transform, which is given by the equation that's included in this annotation here. And to begin, we're going to perform the substitution s equal to j omega. So in this equation here that's in the annotation, we're going to substitute for s the expression j omega. And when we do this, this gives us this first line here. Then we're going to actually perform the substitution, s equal to j omega, which gives us this next line. And now we observe that this highlighted integral is simply a Fourier transform integral, and in particular it's the Fourier transform of the function little x. In other words, we have this last line here. And this is what we were asked to show. Next, I'd like to prove the result that relates the Laplace transform evaluated at an arbitrary point in the complex plane to the Fourier transform. In this example, we're asked to show the relationship that exists between the Laplace transform evaluated at an arbitrary point in the complex plane and the continuous time Fourier transform. In what follows, let big X denote the Laplace transform of little x. To begin, we recall the definition of the Laplace transform, which is given by the equation written in this annotation here. And to begin, we're going to perform a substitution. We're going to rewrite the s in this equation here in terms of its Cartesian form. So we're going to rewrite s as sigma plus j omega, where sigma corresponds to the real part of s, and omega corresponds to the imaginary part of s. So performing this substitution, we obtain this line here. And then we can take the exponential that appears on this line and we can split it into two separate exponentials, which yields this next line. And then we can observe that this highlighted integral is actually a Fourier transform integral. In particular, it's the Fourier transform of the function that's highlighted in green here. In other words, we have this last line here. And this is the result that we were asked to show. At this point, I'd like to consider a couple of examples of computing Laplace transforms of functions. To begin, I'd like to consider example 7.3. In this example, we're asked to find the Laplace transform big X of the function little x, where little x is given by this particular formula here, and A is a real constant. So to begin, we very trivially have this first line. And then we're going to use the definition of the Laplace transform to write out this Laplace transform more explicitly. So from the definition of the Laplace transform, we have this particular integral here. We can then combine the two exponentials, in other words, this exponential and this exponential. And also we can use the unit step function here to change the limits of integration. And doing both of these things leads to this next line here. Now we have an exponential function that we can integrate to obtain this next line here. 
At this point, I'm going to rewrite s in Cartesian form. So I'm going to rewrite s as s equals sigma plus g omega, where sigma corresponds to the real part of s, and omega corresponds to the imaginary part of s. And the reason for doing this is just to reduce the likelihood of making mistakes and simplifying my answer. So performing the substitution, we obtain this next line here. We can then take this exponential function and split it into two separate exponentials, namely a real exponential, which is this exponential here, and a complex sinusoid, which is this exponential here. And we can then take the difference, which gives us this next line here. At this point, we have to be somewhat careful about how we simplify this line. The key thing to pay attention to here are the two exponentials that are shown in green and in purple. If we look at these exponentials more carefully, we can see that the first term in square brackets will only converge if sigma plus a is greater than zero. In this case, this exponential shown in green will be equal to zero and the first term in square brackets just drops out. If sigma plus a is not greater than zero, then this first term will fail to converge, for example, by blowing up to infinity. Therefore, we're going to proceed from here by assuming that sigma plus a is greater than zero, in other words, assuming that this expression does converge. And by the way, sigma plus a being greater than zero is equivalent to the real part of s being greater than minus a. So essentially, we're going to assume that the real part of s is greater than minus a and proceed from here. So proceeding with this assumption, we have this next line here, and we can then rewrite the sigma plus g omega that appears in the denominator here as s, which gives us this next line here. And then we can simplify this to get 1 over s plus a. So our final answer is big X of s is equal to 1 over s plus a, subject to the constraint that the real part of s is greater than minus a. In other words, we have this particular result here. The condition that the real part of s is greater than minus a is a fundamental part of the answer. If we were to leave this condition out, this would be implying that this particular answer, 1 over s plus a, is valid for all complex s, which is clearly not the case. It's only true if real part of s is greater than minus a, which came from the condition that we imposed above here when we were finding our answer. This condition here is referred to as the region of convergence of the Laplace transform. In other words, it's the region in the complex plane for which the Laplace transform converges. At this point, I'm just going to pause and scroll the solution up so we can see the remainder of the solution for this example. The last part of the solution simply illustrates the region of convergence of big X in the cases of a greater than zero in figure a on the left and a less than zero in figure b on the right. Next I'd like to consider example 7.4. In this example, we're asked to find the Laplace transform, big X, of the function little x, where little x is given by this particular formula here, and a is a real constant. So to begin, we very trivially have this first line here, where we now need to simplify this Laplace transform. So to do this, we use the definition of the Laplace transform. In other words, we expand out this Laplace transform in terms of an integral, which gives us this line here. Then we can use the unit step function factor in order to change the limits of integration, which gives us this next line here. Then we can combine the two exponentials that appear in the integrand into a single exponential function, which gives us this next line here. And then we have an exponential that we can integrate, which gives us this line here. Now at this point, we need to be a little bit careful about how we simplify this line. So to make things a little bit less error prone, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite s in Cartesian form. So I'm going to write s as sigma plus j omega, where sigma corresponds to the real part of s, and omega corresponds to the imaginary part of s. So performing this substitution, we end up with this, this next line here, 
we can then split this exponential into two exponentials, one which is a real exponential and one which is a complex sinusoid. We can then take the difference which gets to this next line here and now we need to be a little bit careful about how we simplify this line. So the key thing to observe are the two exp exponential factors that are highlighted in green and purple. If we look at these exponential factors more carefully we can see that the second term in square brackets will only converge if sigma plus a is less than zero. In this case the green highlighted exponential will be equal to zero and the second term just drops out. In the case that sigma plus a is not less than zero, then this second term in the square brackets fails to converge, for example by blowing up to infinity. So in what follows, we're going to assume that sigma plus a is less than zero. In other words, the expression actually converges. And this condition is equivalent to the real part of s is less than minus a. So assuming that this condition is satisfied, we have this next line where we can rewrite the sigma plus j omega in the denominator as s, which gives us this next line here. So we have our final answer, big X of s is equal to 1 over s plus a, subject to the constraint that the real part of s is less than minus a. In other words, we have this particular result here. The condition the real part of s is less than minus a is a fundamental part of the answer. This is referred to as the region of convergence of the Laplace transform. And this constrains for what values of s this expression 1 over s plus a is valid. At this point I'm going to pause and scroll the example upwards so that we can see the remainder of the solution. The last part of the solution simply illustrates the region of convergence of big X in the cases that A is greater than zero in figure A on the left and A is less than zero in figure B on the right. Lastly, I'd like to make an important observation comparing the result of this example, namely example 7.4, to that of example 7.3. So in these two examples, we are asked to find the Laplace transforms of these functions here that are shown in the annotation. Clearly these are distinct functions, in other words, they're not the same function. The Laplace transforms that we obtained were these Laplace transforms here. If we compare the algebraic expressions that we obtained, in other words, the function of s, you'll notice that they're identical in both cases. Both of them are 1 over s plus a. Only the regions of convergence are different. In one case we have an, a greater than sign in the inequality, in the other case we have a less than sign in the inequality. This shows the importance of the region of convergence. If the region of convergence were ignored, it would be possible for distinct functions to have identical Laplace transforms, which would prevent the Laplace transform from being invertible.